It's uh, my pleasure to introduce the next speaker. He traveled all the way from hot St. Louis to cool Chicago. Uh, Dr. Dr. Banks is the Associate Director of the Medical Clinical Research at Mercy Health Research at Ryan Headache Center in St. Louis. Previously, he was the Founder and Director of the Headache Care Center in Roanoke, Virginia. He is an instructor in clinical medicine at Washington University School of Medicine. Dr. Banks received his BA in Psychology cum laude from Washington University in St. Louis and his MD from Marshall University in Huntington, West Virginia. He completed his residency in family practice at St. Vincent's Hospital and Healthcare in Indianapolis and a, fellow of, uh, a fellowship at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. He is board certified in family practice and has certification in headache medicine from the United Council of Neurological Subspecialties. He also has a certificate of added qualification from the National Board for the Certification of Headache Management. Uh, Dr. Thanks is going to talk today about chronic migraine. Thanks, Kevin. I'll go ahead and try to use the ambulatory microphone. Not that I'll walk around a lot. I'm going to try to do this without a cane. This is actually one of my first presentations since undergoing several back surgeries. And, um, this is new to me to have to use a cane, and, and anyway, trying try it up here today is sort of a, a test for me to be able to see if I can get back into speaking and, and being a part of the national scene of uh, headache. Uh, it's a real honor to be participating in this with the National Headache Foundation, and uh, it is the National uh, Headache Awareness Month, and currently ongoing right now at this same time is, the, is a scientific, our national scientific meeting where all the research is reviewed. And I think I was probably like the 10th choice for Dr. Diamond to come up here because most of our colleagues were in, in uh, Los Angeles for the scientific meeting. But um, I backed out just at the last moment that I backed out, not an hour later, I got a call to ask to come up here. I figured, all right, there must be some karma here to do this. So most of you in here are probably here because you have or have someone dear to you that suffer significantly from headache. And be it episodic headache or be it, on my topic, as chronic headache. So we're gonna talk about what is chronic headache, not necessarily chronic migraine, or is it the more, the other most common chronic daily headache is medication overuse, where the medication that people are taking for their headache is actually, the mute is exacerbating the problem, is making the problem worse. Um, or other kinds of, of chronic headaches. And then we'll talk about treatment options. You know, some that are more common and some that are maybe a little less common or a little more innovative. So in pain, we talk about chronic, meaning how long it lasts. So there needs to be at least three months. This is something that's persistent. But it doesn't have to be every single day. It has to be 15 or more days when it's episodic, painful events that in this case is headache. So we have people who have episodic headaches that may be frequent four or five times a month. Might be frequent for you if it completely disables you. Or it might be 20, 25 days a month or every single day, every minute of every day. Or maybe it's just a few hours of every day. But you know we've got a, variety, a wide range of what constitutes chronic headache. Secondary headache, are not very common. I mean, they are, they are causes of chronic headache, but for the most part, you know, they are either episodic headaches, that's the case that uh, we've already had, had illustrated to us, 
that can become chronic or you know, they can be due to some other cause that once you fix that cause, their headaches get better. Chronic daily headache is sort of the term we use. We often use these terms interchangeably between chronic migraine and chronic daily headache without necessarily specifying as we talk to patients and, and even in our management for research, we try to split hairs, um, sometimes more productively, sometimes less productively. It's a considerable burden for the person who's suffering. It's a considerable burden for the medical economy in the United States. You know, upwards of $20 billion a year can be spent in headache care between lost productivity as well as you know, um, indirect lost care to your employer, um, to your family and the hours that you don't get to spend in, in time with your family, much less with your work and your rotation, as well as direct expenses with medical care, hospital visits, ER visits, medications. So it can be challenging to treat. And again, most of you are probably here because you had or have someone near you that is suffering and difficult to manage with this. Um, sometimes it's just a matter of you know trying to communicate and somebody else tries something and they are successful. Um, but the more significant the impact of the headache, probably the more likely you need to be seeing a specialist. It is the leading problem for headache specialty centers. Sometimes we get a bit jaded because all we see, or mostly all we see, are people who are really severely impacted, people who are having headache more days than not. But the majority of the population out there, they you know, have them a few days a month. It may impact them significantly, in which case they're more likely to seek care, or it may just sort of bother them and they struggle through it and they muddle through it, but they get through it. And then they put it aside until the next time it happens. So um, there, are, there are lots of opportunities to try to improve care, to try to improve the awareness of headache so that even people who suffer not frequently, don't have to suffer through it nearly so long. So types of chronic daily headache. There's chronic migraine, and that's really sort of what this focus is on, but there, there's tension type headache, and there's some debate whether a tension type headache is really a disabling headache, or is it some transformation of migraine where the migraine is present sort of in a, a low smoldering state. Uh, in Europe, they're pretty, consistent that there is something called tension type headache that can be chronic and that can be impacting. Um, for the most part, I think chronic tension type headache is not, is not something that should impact you. It's something that may be there, you notice it. So are there tension type headaches that severely impact people? By definition, no, it should not. Medication overuse headache, which I said is the most common, where the medicines that you're taking to treat the headache, to relieve the acute attack, not preventive medicines, those are meant to be taken every day, but acute abortive medicines, what I take to relieve the headache, actually starts to perpetuate the headache. And that's different from being physically dependent upon the medication. New Guinea persistent headache is a unique headache. It, it occurs more often in adolescents, but it can occur in anybody. These are people who generally have no history of headache, and one day they wake up or they develop a headache and they can be oftentimes pinpoint the day. They can tell you, on September 9th, you know, 2009, I woke up with a headache, I've had a headache every day since then. It can be a fairly impacting and a very disabling headache. Um, we don't know what really causes that. We think that it's due to a viral or viral infection. Uh, it, we often ask people, have they been ill uh, at the time of or around the time of developing the headache? Uh, but it is something that you know, does go away some people it's present for a few months, and some people it's present for a few years. Um, the longer it lasts, the longer it's you know, more likely to continue to last. But that's an unusual headache syndrome. And again, no real history of headache. Wake up one day or notice one day having a headache and having a headache every day since. Um, we treat it more or less the same because it does tend to respond to migraine uh, medications. And it often has migraine characteristics to it. Part of that is not because of what, that it's a, it's a different kind of headache. It's actually very similar in what nerves are being activated, that trigeminal nerve and the inflammation of the nerve and the blood vessels. So a lot of these have very similar mechanisms of what's going on. Could be pregnant continue is a unique kind of a headache that is present 
continuously on one side of the head. Half of the head hurts constantly in the cranium continuum. Um, and again, that can occur in people who have no history of episodic migraine or can develop in people who have migraine. But it is a unique headache in that it's present all the time with periods of exacerbation, but it responds almost 100% almost of the time to a specific medication called endomethacin. Um, there are some that have advocated that that's part of the diagnostic criteria, though as we start to understand it more, we're seeing more and more hemicranial continuum that does not respond to endomethacin. And I think that's just, as our awareness increases, we start seeing more and more variations of the theme. Paroxysmal hemicrania are paroxysms, spikes, events, short-lasting events, of one half of the head hurt. But it's, they're short. They're not lasting 12, 24, 72 hours like migraine does. But it is often associated with people being completely disabled by this, um, having a lot of irritation of the eye, tearing the eye, and nasal congestion. It's similar to a cluster headache, but these happen multiple, multiple times a day. It may happen multiple days in a row, and then people may have days with, you know, one or two or a few days with none, and then they start having multiple spells again. But it doesn't happen with the circadian rhythm, the clockwork-like rhythm of cluster headache. And cluster headache is one of these events that when you see it, when you really understand it, it you don't mistake it for a clustering of migraines. I can have migraine attacks that I'm having multiple ones, you know, day for several days, and then I get a couple of days respite, then I get a couple more days of headache, and then I you know, get a few days, maybe you know, for several weeks I'm having lots of headaches, but they are migraine in that I want to be quiet, I want to lie down, I just as soon retreat. Cluster headache tends to occur in cycles where it'll happen at about the same time every day, most often every night. Shortly after people fall asleep, they are awakened by the headache. It's not that you awake with it and notice the headache. The headache awakens. It is severe. It is one of the most debilitating pains. And people have actually, this has been called suicide headache, because people have actually shot themselves, people have injured themselves, just trying and trying to get relief of the pain. They are frenetic. They do not retreat to a quiet place. And that's one of the unique things about cluster headache. And we understand that it originates in the, in the back of the posterior hypothalamus. Um, most of the cluster headache that we see actually turns out to be people having clusters of migraine, but cluster headache is real and it can become chronic. It can be persistent for three months and be on a daily basis. So the types of the prevalence of chronic daily headache really is chronic migraine or transformed migraine. TM is transformed migraine. So that is the great majority of these. 15.3% is the chronic tension type headache, which are the people that have headache more days than not, where it's a dull, diffuse, usually hollow, global head, dull ache. It's not throbbing, um, it's not something that makes them impair their activity, they are not sensitive to light or sound, they're not nauseating. That's chronic tension type headache, it doesn't usually bother people. And then we have that small percentage you know, six, six and a half percent of people that have these secondary headaches or new daily persistent headache or, you know, uh, hips, perhaps of the cranium. So I've already sort of intimated what is the requirement for. So daily or almost daily. And I often just ask patients, do you have headache more days than not? But they should be at least four hours of duration. They should meet migraine criteria if it's going to be chronic migraine. But this occurs on 12 or more days per month. 15 or more days a month of any kind of headache is chronic headache, but chronic migraine is 12 or more days per month of headache that meets migraine criteria. And it does not meet the criteria for new daily persistent or hemicranial continuum or some other disorder. So that is chronic migraine. We've got diagnostic criteria for it. Generally, these people have a history of episodic migraine that just gradually became a little more frequent, a little more frequent, a little more frequent. Generally, this occurs in the peak early years, 25 to 35 to 40, but you know, we'll see people, see teenagers that have chronic <coughs> migraine. And you will see people in their 50s and 60s, but they should have a history of migraine leading up to this. 
So again, daily or nearly daily, head, face, neck, pain, looking for those attacks that resemble migraine. The daily pain, pain, there may always be some sort of pain there. It's not throbbing, it's not keeping me from doing things, but it's there. You know, it's an irritating kind of thing. But there need to be episodes where it, it exacerbates. Most of those exacerbations will respond to migraine type medications. There's most of the everyday headache will respond to migraine type medications, but those are not something you want to take on a daily basis. People who have chronic migraine, chronic daily headache, tend to have a sensitive neurochemistry, sensitive brain chemistry that really tends to run in families. So that idea of if your mom or your dad has migraine, there's a likelihood you're going to have migraine, you know, and the more relatives you have. But there tends to be this genetic predisposition to a more sensitive nervous system. But that also includes a more sensitive nervous system in terms of mood disorders, depression, anxiety, alcoholism, and substance abuse, substance misuse is more common in people who develop chronic migraine by their family history of them, not necessarily them, but in both actually. Medication overuse is seen in 30% of the U.S. population of patients um, with migraine. Now, what we realize is there are about uh, there are a number of people that will have, in a certain population of people over the years, that have frequent migraines, 8, 10 migraines a month. And about 3% of that population every month, or every year, will gradually progress to chronic migraine, to having 12 or more days a month of migraine, 15 more days a month of headache. Um, so, and that's based on a large epidemiologic study. But there are things that actually go and make a significant difference for that. Actually, I, that was my next slide. Risk factors, I'll go back to it. Risk factors for chronification. Obesity. Well, which, who of us that nowadays is not, you know, could lose a little bit, a few pounds. But the more significant the obesity, we recognize obesity, adipose tissue, fat tissue, is pro-inflammatory. It actually causes inflammation, it sustains inflammation. You eat a fatty meal, you're more likely to hurt, not just a headache, not just, I'm not talking about triggers, I'm just saying fatty foods, are pro-inflammatory, they make us feel young. But we're so used to eating them that we don't realize it. Until you finally fix your diet, and you start staying off of fatty foods, and then you eat a fatty meal, you'll see how different it makes you feel. Um, smoking makes a difference. Low socioeconomic status, you know, well, how do you, I mean, how does that relate? We don't know. But, you know, some would consider, you know, that migraine is, is a disease of high achievers. Yet maybe chronic daily headache leads to not being able to achieve much and become a low socioeconomic stress. Life stressors. Having lots of stress in your life is pro-inflammatory. So you know we all have stress. We're gonna have stress our whole lives. How do we deal with stress? Well, sometimes we do a better job of it than other times. There are periods of your life where you're gonna have a lot more headaches and a lot more stress. Periods of your life where you have less stress, you have less headaches. Maybe you have less headaches because you're having less stress, or maybe you have less stress because you're having less headaches. But this is a periodic thing. Snoring, does that relate to obesity? Well, we, not necessarily. We know that people who have sleep disorders, and we do do a lot of screening, um, sleep study for our chronic headache patients. And then probably the most important are the use of certain medications. Butalbital, which is the active ingredient of Fioracet. Butalbital is one of the most, most, one of the worst medications you can take for episodic migraine, particularly if you have frequent migraine. That population of 3% progresses to chronic migraine in a year. If people take butalbital three or four times a month, that risk goes up to 30%. Three or four times a month, much less three or four times a week. Opiates, narcotics, are also very bad. Again, five to six times a month. So not, maybe not as bad as if you have a talk, but five or six times a month of taking a narcotic, if you have frequent migraine, ups your risk of getting chronic migraine by 25%, 30%. So these are some of the worst medicines to take for your headache. Unfortunately, they're some of the cheapest, and people often say, well, I feel better with it. Why can't I take it? So transform migraine starts as this episodic headache that gradually becomes more frequent. And it may be migraine with or without aura. The migraine frequency 
starts increasing. But then what starts happening is in between the headaches, the, the episodic headaches, people are getting a dull, diffuse, tension-type headache that's sort of smoldering at the bottom. And so you get a headache, and it goes back to normal. You get a headache, it goes back to normal. And you start getting a headache, and it doesn't quite hit normal. And you get another one, and it doesn't quite get normal. And gradually, this will progress to a, you know, now my baseline is having a headache. I may still get spikes on top of that, but I'm always having some sort of headache. Basically, what's happening is the brain is learning to hurt. These, this nervous system is being inflamed, the nerves are becoming activated, and it really is oftentimes what I tell people is the brain's learning to hurt. Medications tend to become less effective, though they may still be effective, they become less effective when people often have to repeat the dosing more frequently. This is not this, this can lead to a dependence, particularly if it's caffeine or if it's butalbital or if it's opiates, but even taking a triptan non you know, migraine specific medication, something like sumatriptan, or which you may know as, as Imitrex, or Maxol, Rizotriptan, the various triptans. Taking that more than two or three times a week, consistently, week after week after week, will increase the risk of developing transformed migraine. And so those medicines, which are not physically uh, you're dependent, you don't develop dependency on it, will increase the frequency of your headaches. The narcotics are not necessarily, I'm addicted to them, I'm taking them two or three times a week. That's not a withdrawal, but it may be sufficient to up the regulation of your brain and the nervous system to cause pain. So, other causes of transformation that are trauma. People, and I saw a woman yesterday that, you know, she's been getting Botox, but she's also, you know, she's just getting a bit older and she's having problems with her balance and she tried to step over a garden hose and she fell. She you know, had a concussion, she's bruised up on her face, um, got a laceration, needed stitches. And for the past two weeks, she's had a horrible headache that's migraine-like. But it wasn't because of her migraines, it was because of, of the head trauma. So we will see that. It can be neck issues. It can be concurrent illnesses, um, particularly if it's a viral syndrome, oftentimes way up on the headache. And that, then it's stuck there. I often tell people, well, you know, we don't know what made you finally get there, but it may have happened. It's like I used to have three or four a year, and now all of a sudden I'm having a headache you know, nearly every single day, and that happens just like over a matter of weeks. So sometimes it's a viral illness that that can, can lead to. And then, of course, two or more days a month, well, let's say more than two days a month, so two or three days a month, a week, I'm sorry, two or three days a week of taking an acute abortive medicine they actually increase your headaches. And I can't emphasize that enough. Now, we'll work with people to come up with alternative treatments so that you don't have to. But the problem is, I'll take Excedrin two to three days a week. And I'll take my Triptan two or three days a week. Well, I'm going to take it two or three days a week. No, it's four to six days a week. It's not a matter of, you know, of which medicine you take, how often. It's a matter of how often you take a medication to avoid the headache. So that's the number one problem we face. Um, trauma, I mentioned already, the spine issues certainly do exist. And a lot of people will have chronic migraines that aren't really having that much pain in the back of their head or neck. But we do need to you know, be conscious that there may be some upper spinal issues that are contributing to that. We know that the trigeminal nerve, which primarily comes from the front half of the face forward, does have a lot of close connections and interaction to cross talk with it's term I use, with the cervical nerves. And so this whole the whole area is basically the trigemino cervical complex. And so people who have a tendency to migraine, if they get a whiplash injury, they complain of a lot of headaches as well as a sore neck. Most people get a whiplash, they don't have migraine. Most people want a migraine. All they have is a sore neck. So again, there's this more elaborate, more sensitive nervous system. Sinus issues do exist. We see a lot of people who say, well, that's my sinus headache. And episodic sinus headache doesn't really exist. True sinus headache, you are sick. You've got bloody pus coming from your nose. I'm sorry. But you've got fever. You are ill. And you are ill for weeks, months. That's true sinus headache. We don't see that that much. But if you have a tendency to migraine and you have some sinus irritation, maybe it's just allergies that day, or maybe it is a sinus infection you know, or sinus congestion from a cold, that may cause you to have more migraines. 
So chronic allergies may contribute to migraines if you've got that tendency, but if you don't have the tendency, you just have sinus congestion. It doesn't lead to that throbbing, pounding, you know, Lord take me home and headache. So, um, and the biggest issue is genetic factors. <coughs> we do understand that there is truly inflammatory interactions going on that lead to free radical re um, responses. And it's an injury, free radical would be oxidation reactions that lead to a higher deposit deposition of iron in the periaqueductal gray matter of the brain. All pain processes through the periaqueductal brain. You don't need to know where that is, um, except it's near the aqueduct, which the spinal fluid goes through. Um, but we've been able to demonstrate that people with chronic headaches, chronic migraine, have a, have a higher deposition of iron in that. And so I often know it's a little too simplistic. I like the analogy. If you think of the nervous system as a, as a wiring system and it's you know, going off, it's being short-circuited when you have migraine. So now remember your little school experiment where you got the wires attached to the battery and you know, the light bulb and you cut the wires, but if you sprinkle iron filings across the wires, now the light bulb comes back on. So it's sort of like that in a sense that you know that you just sort of your brain has gotten short-circuited. Like I said, that's a real oversimplification, but it's something you can grab and sort of hold on to. So and again, most of the brain just learns to hurt. Rebound headache, I think I've already sort of beaten that enough now. So uh, I've already mentioned the butalbital containing compounds and the narcotic medications are particularly the worst. Triptans can do this, ergotamine can do this, or other vasoconstrictors, Sudafed. And that's a big part of the sinus headache is the vasoconstriction that the decongestants or, or people are taking for will help relieve some of the swelling and some of the pressure and some of the blood flow so it's less inflamed and so I think I'm feeling better. But you may actually be exacerbating the problem. It's not a blood vessel problem. It's a nerve problem. So how do we diagnose this and what do we need to do? Well, you know, should people be imaged? Um, you know, it's not usually all that helpful in chronic daily headache because most of our patients, we've got this history, which is the biggest thing, history, history, history. The history sort of tells us what it is. But if we see a change in the pattern, or if there's some you know, abnormal neurologic exam, if there's something that's just not right, you definitely should have some sort of neuroimaging done with this. Um, laboratory testing can be done because we have metabolic issues that can cause it. People that have migraine, if they become diabetic, if their sugars are out of control and they are already diabetic and their sugars get out of control, they'll often have more frequent migraines. If a, if a migraine sufferer develops hypothyroidism, they're going to have a lot of headaches. So oftentimes we'll see migraine patients that are doing well, and all of a sudden they deteriorate, and they're having a lot more headaches. <coughs> we're going to check some metabolic things, and we'll see. Maybe they're anemic, or maybe their thyroid's off. So we do check the metabolic things. Um, infectious autoimmune disorders. People who have autoimmune disorders are more likely to have chronic headaches because of this chronic inflammation. Um, lumbar puncture. And, and spinal fluid analysis, if you re truly are not improving, we've done a number of things and, and evaluations. A lumbar puncture with spinal fluid analysis is not inappropriate. Um, it's not done, I think, probably nearly enough. But you know, that is a scary procedure. I can tell you it's really not any more painful than you know, having blood drawn from your arm. You've got to lay still for a while afterwards and you may get a post-spinal tap headache. Um, where now the spinal fluid is leaking when it's low, but um, it's really not that painful. The way we do it now, we have it done in the hospital where people are um, under x-ray guidance. The local numbing medicine is what stings the most. But there you can see where, where the needle is, and so it's not a poking and body. You know, they slip the needle in, we check the spinal fluid pressure, we check the spinal fluid, collect spinal fluid, send it to the lab for analysis, and slip the needle out, and people you know, hurt what they feel was the numbing medicine going in. So management. Management, most of all, most important, is communicate and educate. You need to know what's going on with you. I need to explain it to you in a way that you understand it. And we need to work together to, these are medicines that we're going to try. Why am I trying this medicine? What are the potential side effects of this medicine? What are the, you know, how long is it going to take? What kind of dose should we be looking at? We've got to talk about that. And so you're, if you go to a headache specialist, and your first visit is going to be a long visit. If you go to you know, a non-headache specialist, your visit is probably going to be 
pretty short. You know, we need to talk to communicate. We need to understand what we're trying to do. We need to identify and reinforce the things that exacerbate your headaches. You know, if this causes you to get a headache, don't do it. If you're coming to us with chronic daily headache, it's not a matter of, well, I get a headache you know, every time I eat you know, a Nathan's hot dog. Don't eat Nathan's hot dogs. Is that the only time you get headaches? Yeah. Okay, we fixed you. <laughs> but you know, you do what you will identify. There are certain things that cause you to get a bad or more severe headache and things that you know maybe help you get better. I know whenever I go and do yoga, I get you know, I'm, I'm better for a couple of days. Or I know that if I take a walk every day, I do better. So lifestyle management is a big part of, of this. You've got to identify, you've got to pay attention to it. So you become very active in managing your headaches. We treat comorbidities. So if you're depressed, you may be having more headaches, so we treat the depression, which may help the headaches, but you would, you know, you have the chronic headaches regardless. And so we can, you know, if we treat the depression, that may only take you up a notch. Um, you know, if you have sinus issues, you've got others, so we treat the comorbidities. One of the important things, and, and Dr. Roger Candy, who is um, I guess executive director of the National Headache Foundation, and, um, he you know, likes to use this, don't repeat failure. Why do you keep taking something that doesn't work? Why do I keep hoping it works? I'm afraid that if I don't take it, it'll get worse. You know, don't repeat failure. And so that's, again, what we've got to talk about, what we've tried. We need to limit the acute therapies. We've got to come up with some alternative abortives. And, and every headache specialist sort of has their own unique little special things they like to try. Um, giving an adequate dose and an adequate time of a trial of a preventive medicine is very important. And then understand treatment is a process. It takes time for that sensitive nervous system that's learned to hurt to learn not to hurt. You didn't get bad all at once. Well, yeah, the new daily persistent headache did get bad all at once. The post-traumatic headache got bad all at once. But generally, once the brain's learned to hurt, it takes time to unlearn. And so it's a process, and we've just got to be patient with it and work with it. So, um, Multidisciplinary management is very, very critical to this. Behavioral therapy, lifestyle management, diet. Keep a regular schedule. Go to bed at the same time. Get up at the same time. Eat regular meals. Watch what you eat. Don't eat unhealthily. Exercise regularly. Develop some sort of relaxation mechanism. You know, and you know, it may be yoga, it may be Tai Chi. There's data for acupuncture. It's a very reasonable trial for for helping chronic daily headache. And physical therapy, massage therapy, is also very useful. And it, unfortunately, people often go, well, I'll do this, well, that helped for a little while, but help. so now I'm gonna do this, and well, that helped for a little while, and now I'm gonna do that, instead of trying to do it all sort of combined together. Medications, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on medications, but recently the American Pattern of Neurology and the American um, Headache Association, or American, now. American Headache Society um, came out with evidence-based guidelines for preventive treatment for episodic migraine. But these medications have strong, solid data behind them. What medicine we use depends on the history and a lot of different circumstances. There's not one medicine that's better than another. There's not one medicine that's necessarily going to always work in, in, the, in every person. So I often tell people, if I could run a test that would tell me what's going to work for you, there was some way I would not do it. I mean, I don't want to walk around and try three different things before we get the right thing, but it is a trial and error process. So FDA approved migraine preventive therapies, topiramate, topiramate, <coughs> valproate, or valproate, which is Depakote, um, both seizure medications, have their own set of side effects, and then <coughs> for Pranolol and Timol, or blood pressure medicines, and then the most recent one is onobotulinum toxin A, or what you know as Botox is approved for chronic migraine now. Medications have strong evidence, but not, necessarily, not as strong as this level A, uh, level one evidence. Metoprolol, which is another beta blocker. Um, Butterbur, which actually is a herbal supplement that has had three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials and has shown a reduction in headaches by 60, 65%, about 60% of patients. <coughs> Brovitriptan or triptan for short-term prophylaxis, a menstrual migraine prophylaxis. And antidepressants. Certain antidepressants have, have had some solid evidence. Specifically, amitriptyline. 
Venlafaxine is another one that's a little bit different. Um, a couple of other beta blockers, tenolol and nanolol, a couple of other tryptans that seem to have a longer half-life that people can use for a short period of time. Over on the left hand or your right hand side of the screen, certain nostril inflammatory prescription ones can be helpful as a preventative. We may use those, but that should be done under you know, a healthcare provider's watchful eye to how often you take what dose you take. Magnesium, reasonable thing to try. Which magnesium? You know, magnesium oxide is the most commonly one available. Magnesium glycinate or glutinate is very you know, gentle on the stomach. Some people recommend you know, a chelated magnesium. You, know, you just have to find, but don't get magnesium <coughs> syndrome. That will cause you with diarrhea. Riboflavin, vitamin B2. Lots of data showing that there's some benefit. Not, again, not solid data, not double blind placebo control, but riboflavin in high doses is very helpful for migraine. Um, Feverfew is another herbal supplement that may be beneficial. And then subcutaneous or intravenous histamine. Um, that's something that's not widely used. It's used here at the Diabetic Center. We use it in St. Louis. Um, the idea is histamine is part of the headache inflammatory process. And histamine injections can be like an allergy um, tolerance where you actually get low doses to try to develop you know, a greater threshold for histamine causing a headache. And there's been some good solid data for that as well. So lots of other medicines I'm not going to go into, but notice CoQ10 is you know, not great data. Estrogen is not great data. Omega-3 fish oil is not great data. Omega-3 fish oil and CoQ10 are perfectly safe. There's no reason to not try it. Estrogen's got another issue about it. The hyperbaric oxygen is not real solid data. And the things that are, I um, uh, didn't put down the things that were proven in effect. Botox, the most, most recently approved, it is expensive. It, it requires 31 injections of 155 units or more, but 31 sites spread throughout the front, side, and back of the head and the shoulders. Um, it has to be repeated about every 12 weeks. It's been very effective for some people. What was fascinating was the frequency of migraine in the studies that were done, 23 days about um, of headache every month. And the improvement was only about seven or eight days. So having you're know, still 15 days a month of headache. People still had to take medicines, but people, what they found was their quality of life was dramatically improved, significantly improved. If you go from 23 days a month of headache to 15 days a month, that's made a big difference for your life. But even you know, it's still having the headaches, people found that they were more functional. So there may be some benefit. We're doing a lot of it. No longer can insurance companies say it's not approved, it's investigational. Well, no, now it's approved, they can't say it's investigational, but they still want to make you jump through hoops before you can get it. And so it's not the panacea, it's not necessarily for everyone. Finally, you know, more aggressive treatment options. There are inpatient treatment centers. There are several scattered about the country, but not, not a lot. Diamond Headache Center was the first in the United States. Ryan Headache Center was the second. Um, we no longer do inpatient work. We do ambulatory outpatient infusions. So we do an intensive infusion therapy with people going to their own home or staying in a hotel. Or sometimes we'll arrange to do home infusions. A little bit more problematic with that, but they're you know, often enough we're utilizing IV therapies. The inpatient treatment centers are nice because they actually have their own pain management people there. They have their own physical therapist. Um, they have their own psychologist, and so they can really integrate the therapy intensively while you are in the hospital. And if you have to go off of medications, they can do that safely, and they can ramp up medications safely, fairly quickly, um, much more quickly than we do as an outpatient. But there are more aggressive treatments that can be done for this. So I think I missed one slide. I must have been higher on that. So um, sorry for the abrupt end on that. But, so basically, chronic daily headache is common. Chronic daily headache is most often migraine, transform migraine, the brain is going to hurt, and or medication overuse headache. There are other chronic headache syndromes. Treatments, there are medications, but it really should be an integrated, multidisciplinary approach that really does require you actively managing your life. And it may take, you know, you've got to take two weeks of vacation 
so that you can get off your medication and you can start this new process you know, of doing things. Maybe that's better than slugging through the day the way you have been. Um, again, you know, foundations like the National Headache Foundation are really providing an avenue for patients to get a lot of information. And I have to echo what, what Dr. Diamond has said. You know, you're here tonight. If you're not a member of the National Headache Foundation, I'd strongly recommend it. Um, great patient advocacy, great patient education, um, and a lot of good news. You, know, you can find out about research studies or you know, events like this and share them with people around the country. With that, I will stop and let Dr. Diamond speak.